Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the second live panel of EdTech Week. We've gathered uh, some of the brightest and the best uh, schools and colleges from across the uh, across England to share their learning, to share what's gone well, to share some of their mistakes. And that seems to be uh, a key uh, open, honest dialogue of this week is that uh, we in many ways want to prevent you from making the mistakes that we've all made. Um, and there is virtue, I think, in uh, you know trying uh, directions, reversing directions and, tr and trying uh, other things. I'll quickly take you around uh, the panel for introductions and we're going to try and focus on how do schools go from what was an emergency response uh, in lots of ways, uh, the most amazing uh, professional development undertaken in days, sometimes hours, schools doing the best with what they had uh, and also the best with what they understood and were capable of working with. And in terms of uh, education technology, what we've tried to do in the uh, ed, uh, education demonstrator project is share those lessons. And I hope this strategy, uh, this workshop will help you think through how to build longer term strategies to go from that emergency response to much more deep uh, and wide uh, interaction with digital uh, across your school or college. Emma, could I start with you in terms of introductions? We'll just quickly go around the panel and then come to you for your uh, first comments. OK, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Emma Darcy. I'm the Director of Technology for Learning for the Chiltern Learning Trust. Um, I'm also on the senior leadership team at Denby High School in Luton, which is a, um, an ed tech demonstrator school. And obviously the same as everyone else on the panel today, we've had a very interesting and challenging time since the, the first lockdown. And we'll be talking to you a bit more about that later on. Paul, welcome from Sheffield. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Paul Haig. I'm the head teacher of King Edmund School in Sheffield. We're a large 11 to 18 comprehensive school uh, up in Sheffield. Um, personally, I've been interested in uh, what we now call education technology, ed tech, uh, for well over 20 years, speaking and writing about the issue. Um, and then finally, uh, as a head, able to put some of my ideas into action. So we are also an ed tech demonstrator school. Neil, welcome. Thank you, Paul. Welcome, Neil, from uh, what was a very windy Blackpool yesterday. Your microphone, I think. Hi, my name's Neil Oldham. I'm head teacher at High Furlong School in Blackpool. We're a two to 19 special school um, with approximately 100 children on roll. So we're quite a large special school for children with complex medical needs and um, general learning difficulties too. Uh, we've been working really closely as one of the um, few special schools involved in the EdTech Demonstrator programme, looking particularly at um, the use of assistive technology to help our pupils um, to communicate as well as to access learning. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, really appreciate you being with us. I know you've got schools to run um, and I really appreciate this 45 minutes out of your busy lives to share some of the lessons. Emma, could I take you back? Um, you said it had been uh, my words, a bit of a roller coaster uh, in terms of lockdown number one uh, and now uh, in in number two, but with schools open now. Um, what 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 was it like going back to March? I mean, were you in a, a better position as a school because you you've been thinking about digital for quite a while? I, I think we were in a fortunate position tie in terms of we already had the same systems across all the school in our trust we'd set those up uh, we were fortunate in that we had a one-to-one um, -one Chromebook scheme at Denby so perhaps you could say that more of our pupils had access to devices than perhaps in some other schools um, but were we 100% where we wanted to be no of course we weren't you know we, we we never saw this coming I don't think anyone could have done and it meant that um, the biggest job for us was to very much sort of try and um, upskill our teachers coming from a range of different um, different sort of skills points. So and, and evolve to this new way of working. And I think you use the phrase, Ty, the, the fierce intensity of now. 
And that was so true. That really struck a chord with me because it was every every decision that you made, every new thing that happened. It was it was such a sort of responsive, reactive time. We were having to, all having to evolve so quickly. Um, and I think in schools you were used to, you know, you set very clear guidelines, you set clear protocols, and this was just a new way of working for for all of us. So it was really having to sort of transform and um, and adapt to that. So even with a school that that, that had explored digital in, in in terms of supporting teaching and learning, there were there were there were still challenges for you in terms of uh, staff professional development and, and and other issues. Absolutely, because I think as a teacher, you are normally used to in an ideal world being in the class with your pupils. Um, teaching not from the front but but teaching with with your pupils physically there and although we had done a lot of work with um, setting homework remotely delivering some lessons online all of a sudden when all of your pupils are out of school it's a completely different context and obviously what you would normally do is you would look at staff training and again that training would normally be done in person maybe as an after school session with everyone sat there so it was having to move to a completely different model of of teaching but also of, of training and I think that even staff that would have identified themselves as some of our tech leaders really very confident staff with using technology it flagged up to them all the things that they still needed to learn how to do and normally you have the luxury of a rollout of maybe sort of several weeks or half a time um, of something this was so urgent and so necessary immediately that we didn't have that luxury of time and in some ways I think that was a good thing because it meant that staff had to move outside their comfort zones and learn things really quickly but in other ways I think the pressure that that put on everyone obviously was, was really intense was really was really fierce. That's interesting. Paul can I can I go to you and, and, and in your introduction you were talking about you know 20 years of of thinking and, and writing about what you said. What, what, I don't know what it was called 20 years ago, but what is now called uh, education, technology, digital, uh, online learning. Um, what was it like for you? Did you feel uh, totally confident your leadership? This was this was the moment that that you had been called upon all your writing and, uh, and thinking in terms of teaching and learning had led to this or was it as wobbly as, as it was for other people? Uh, ab absolutely, Ty. M much more the uh, the former rather than the latter. Otherwise, in set, that was the position I had to take as a leader. It was it was a day to stand up. If I had any any foresight, it was that I'd been skiing uh, in Italy at <laughs> half term, and uh, it hadn't really occurred to me until I had my temperature taken at the airport that something big was going on. And then I came home after that February half term and was watching what was happening in Europe. And I knew, despite what people might have been saying at home. Yeah. it was coming here so I maybe had two or three weeks warning yeah. that, that, that that it was coming um, and yeah uh, that that was that, that the way you describe it is the way it was I was a bit frightened because it was a little bit bit Woodstock-esque you know book it um, what, what's the phrase build it and they will come yes. um, so I said we're going to do this I said on the when, when we knew the the uh, school closure was officially confirmed I said Monday morning 9 a.m the King Edward Virtual School opens and we will be open for business. The curriculum will, has already been designed. It's really good. Uh, the sequences of learning are already planned. They're really good. You teachers are great at your job. Most of our families are really well connected on the internet. We've got about 20% of the children are, are disadvantaged. Talk more about them later maybe. Yeah. Um, so there was a bit of bravery, a bit of bravado, if you like, to say, right, we're just going to do this. And then we worked out how to do it over the first few weeks. So isn't that, isn't that the definition of leadership in some ways? Bravery meets bravado. I think so. Yeah, because if if you shy away from challenges, then you, 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 you're not meeting them head on. So uh, yeah, it, there there were some revelations that there was technology sitting under our noses that's been there for ten years that we haven't been capitalising on. But uh, that's some of the positives of what's happened is we've really understood the potential of our own technology much better. And that curriculum and that sequencing you were talking about was that is it a different curriculum for digital? Is it no, no, far from it. I think I think that's where I, I took issue with some schools who were uh, providing uh, stopgap work and reinforcement and we're going to revise things we've done in the past. And, and I did assemblies to every single year group on the last day of school and said, I don't think I'll be seeing most of you until September. And I was proven to be right. And even teachers were shocked to hear me say that. So again, if I had a little bit of foresight, uh, I, I was right. But in that respect, there was no uh, lockdown curriculum. Here's some things that we can ask you to do when you're stuck at home. We said, no, we know what we need to teach. 
it's how we teach it that needs to change, but why we need to teach it and why the order is the way the order is and uh, and the levels and the challenge and the relationship between the teachers and the students. Um, the, how many hours you spend on each subject, all that thinking had been done and tried and tested. We're a very successful school and actually the well-being angle was was absolutely paramount. I think if I'd had a two year warning yeah. to say you're going to open a virtual school, we would have completely remodeled the way we deliver teaching and learning. But when it was about the whole country going into a crisis and saying to families and meeting up on YouTube and telling the parents, I want your children up at nine o'clock and working because Monday period one on their timetable says history. That's what we'll be doing was to give some stability, some normality. But, but actually, if you were going for a 100 percent virtual school, which I don't think is anyone's vision, uh, but, you know, the Open University doesn't work on 25 taught lessons a week, does it? No, it doesn't. What about some of the headlines today about learning loss? I mean, um, I, from 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 Ofsted. I mean, are you able are you able to assess yet? Uh, are you able to give uh, a, a wild generalization about learning loss? Do you think do you think you were able to protect learning loss or inspire learning in lots of ways? I've got. I mean, you might say it's it's uh, it's semantics, but I don't think you can lose something you never had. So we've all had an interruption in, in our lives and, and we pick up the pieces and take the next steps as appropriate. So in that respect, um, we, we always meet children whenever the first time you teach a class or teach a child and you pick up what you've got, you assess where they're at and you drop yeah. them off further on. So in that respect, we're doing no different. Can I actually quantify the learning loss? No, because again, we haven't radically redesigned our assessment. Uh, there are exams and assessments coming in at the moment and over the next few weeks, but I don't have a parallel data set to say where this year's year 11 would have been had this not happened. So actually, I don't really want to spend too much time working on thinking about that. I want to do what we've always done, which is good teaching, find out what children know uh, and fix the things they don't know. And yes, we're all feeling a bit uh, uh, of pressure, particularly with our exam groups in secondary because the clock is ticking. And we're not entirely sure what the exams are going to look like next summer. Uh, and we're acutely aware that everybody will have some kind of uh, learning loss, if we're going to use that phrase, because they haven't had as many lessons as they should have had in the normal way. And the way our assessment and qualifications is designed at the moment is based on what you can do in 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 face to face teaching and specialist accommodation in schools. And obviously we didn't have that, um, but there is a bit of a uh, tail wagging the dog story there, which uh, is again maybe for another day about qualifications. Yeah, that's for a different conversation, maybe. Neil, uh, lots lots has happened to, to, to your school, Blackpool, um, and yourself indeed. Um, I don't know whether you can see the roller coaster from the school, but uh, it, 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 it certainly felt like that when we, we've talked about your work. Um, what was it like looking back, if you don't mind, in, in, in March? Yeah, well, I think our, our first concern was obviously around the impact of the virus with children with complex medical needs. Um, we actually closed slightly before the national closure um, advice from health because of course we had um, such a high volume of clinically, extremely clinically vulnerable children. Um, we already had um, a really good VLE set up for um, between school and home. So we have regular communication four, five, six times a day with with families where our children can't go home necessarily and tell the parents what they've been doing in school today. So our staff are regularly doing that throughout the day with uh, pictures, um, video clips and things. So we already had roughly three quarters of our parent community that were working with us digitally anyway. So we were in a very good position, but obviously we had a quarter of them that we needed to reach very, very quickly. And for us to continue engaging with families and children um, for the teaching, but also for the therapies, speech and language, um, other kinds of therapies that we needed to work with, we had to make sure that the parents were aware of how to use the technology um, because um, so many of our children wouldn't necessarily be able to access that independently. Um, and, and then that for us threw up issues with, well, it wasn't appropriate for us to follow our normal in-school timetable because some of the parents were at home and trying to work. They were also obviously had other siblings and various things and it had to fit around them meeting the care needs of our pupils as well. 
Um, so we had to do a lot, a mixture, find that balance and do a mixture of pre-recorded um, lessons and um, demonstrations that they could then access um, at convenient times throughout the day and then post things back to us using our, um, our VLE. So we had quite a challenge in that sense. And of course, um, as Paul and Emma said, it was immediate. It had to happen now. Um, we weren't sure how long we would be closed, but again, we we were similar to Paul and said, you know, this is not going to be two weeks, three weeks. This is going to be um, the next school year before we see school back in full situ. So how did you think about your your approach? You, you, you've clearly got, um, you know, a, a team around the child. Yeah, um, you've got multi professionals working with those young people there's a level of vulnerability as you said uh, yeah. how how did you think think about that and, and and some of those big challenges well i mean our our strategies obviously uh, aren't just for school staff we have um a team of nhs staff that are on site as well so first and foremost we had to make sure that we um, upskilled all those staff uh, the teaching community in our school uh, amounts to a fifth of our workforce um, our teachers are really skilled with the technology but our um, some of our associate staff not necessarily were so we had to really quickly um, look at how we were going to engage with those um, wider staff to be able to deliver this because of course it wouldn't be possible we only have 10 teachers in our school but for the teaching staff to take that work on um, so it, it was really straight back to the drawing board as a senior team um, but not just as a senior team bringing all of the staff teams in uh, on those remote staff meetings that we had initially to say you know how are we going to achieve um, what we want to achieve and, and, and then before we could answer that question really underpinning and, and exploring what do we want to achieve over the coming weeks and months uh, and I think by doing that and getting all the staff involved and then putting in the right training for each of them um, really really helped. So do, does Paul's words resonate then in, in terms of being emergency response you had to as a leader you were you were thinking really quickly um, yeah. I mean, we've talked about what you had to do in terms of the uh, of your budget in 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 July just to keep yourself going. I mean, I thought that was well, that was leadership. Neil. Well, what we did obviously at, at first it was emergency response. It's here, it's now. Um, no luxury of um, exploring lots of different avenues. It's here. We've got to respond to it now. Uh, but then very quickly, um, how do we sustain what we're putting in place? How do we fund what we're putting in place and then how do we improve it? How do we quality assure and improve this uh, when it's not in front of you and it's not face to face? So what we uh, did, obviously, the technology that we're using and the technology that we've had to replicate in homes for a lot of our pupils is hugely expensive. Uh, specialist equipment. We made the decision um, in August that the budget that we planned for for this academic year um, around February, March uh, had no resemblance to actually what we were dealing with or what we were spending. So we made the decision with our finance team and we completely redid the whole school budget in August, uh, ready for a September start so that we could um, buy more devices, buy more laptops, improve our infrastructure um, to be able to continue because we still have, even though schools are open since September, we still have a core of our children who are following what's happening in school but remotely so we've still got a mix of remote learning and um, children in school. Uh, what's it what's it felt like in terms of a, a, a staff team there I mean I know you've 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 gained a lot of support from you're in a consortium of uh, yeah. Hambleton, uh, Ribblesdale, the, uh, we call it the Northwest Consortium uh, even though there are other schools in the northwest, but but you three uh, institutions and you, you you seem like a really tight uh, team as as an ed tech demonstrator. Yeah, absolutely, and and I think that obviously with with Hambleton, they're a Google based school, um, uh, and with Ribblesdale, they're Microsoft. So we've got both ends of the spectrum. Then our, ourselves, obviously, in the middle with the specialist tech and being able to really advise them about how to um, reach out to SEN children and support 
SEM children who, who were perhaps working without the support that they would normally experience in school. I think for our staff, um, and I, th I, I would imagine that's mirrored right across education, we've just seen this huge step up to the challenge. Um, in the initial months, it wasn't just about delivering um, lessons and learning and staying in touch with children. It was very much about, um, you know, you know, everyone coming together, delivering food parcels in addition to the learning, delivering. Um, we, we set up a resource bank of all the sensory learning equipment. Um, it's almost like a, a library because it's so specialist and expensive. Uh, and then that went out to families on a week's loan and came back in with sanitised and quarantined and then went out. So our staff set up, you know, I would never have thought of that as a head. I've, you know, it wasn't on my radar at all, but the staff were saying we've got all this wonderful equipment and the children need this at home. So we're going to put in this loan scheme. So they've just completely stepped up for me um, in what they've offered, in what they've learnt in such a short time. Uh, and in the way that they've responded and delivered. And, and you as a leader, um, you, you, you've been on a journey then. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> it's definitely been the most learning I've ever done. Um, I, I, I think um, absolutely, you know, and, and it's really, I, I think in terms of leading, it's been really much about having that strong team around you, not just in your own establishment, but particularly with being a part of a consortium with the demonstrator school, drawing on their expertise and sharing through our work as a consortium has been absolutely invaluable. Kept you going? Yeah, oh absolutely yeah and you know the professional networks where you're thinking as a head wow you know how are we going to get through this but every other head and every other education colleague is feeling the same and, and you kind of keep each other going I think. Thanks very much, um, thanks Neil. Um, Emma, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about your work as um, an EdTech demonstrator school um, and the feedback has been really, really positive um, from your work, uh, the interactions that you have with supported schools. It's, it's a free programme uh, funded by the Department for Education, uh, a shining light, I think, in many ways of how to, how to work peer to peer um what 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 have you been meeting out there because they're not just schools from from around Luton are there that that, no. you, that you work with what 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 are the issues what's what's some of those short term issues and and has it made you kind of reflect on where we are as a country as uh, where we are as England as a country in terms of digital infrastructure devices it's been a huge eye opener for me, Ty, I'll be really honest. I think sometimes when you're working within your own in-school environment or even within a, a trust or within a, a consortium, you're very aware of what's going on in your own school and in your partner schools, but you perhaps don't always get to see what's happening nationally. And being part of the EdTech Demonstrator programme has been so interesting because um, the schools that we've sort of been put in touch with, where you think their starting point are going to be in, in terms of how they're using technology, you often find that perhaps you're overestimating things, but you're taking for granted things that aren't necessarily the case. So, um, for example, just starting with the idea about a, a digital strategy, schools say, well, what's a digital strategy? Or oh, you mean we need to replace our computers in a few years time? It's like, no, that's not that's not a digital strategy. Um, it, you know, it's where do you want to be? How are you going to get there? And um, also some of the barriers that schools have, have got as well, you know, in terms of leadership teams that perhaps don't get it or haven't understood it for more now. I mean, you know, we're talking here with sort of senior leaders in schools who completely understand the importance of this. Um, we, we've been speaking to a number of schools where it's been much more of a struggle. And if anything positive has come out of this whole horrendous COVID situation, it's the fact that at least schools now are seeing the value of ed tech technology for learning and why it needs to be given a, a, a priority. But we found that um, very much a lot of the support we've had to give to schools has been on the strategic side, what you should be aiming to do, what's possible. Um, and then it's almost like they don't know what they don't know. You're, you're having to do a lot of sort of saying, well, you could be doing this. This is what it could look like for you. Um, giving them models of CPD that could work, giving them sort of achievable goals and aims for the next six months and then the next year and then the next three years. Um, and also trying to 
get schools to understand that it needs to be a whole school strategy. I thought it was really interesting what Neil was saying about that the whole school training and everyone knowing how to use this technology because if your support staff don't know how to use it if your TAs don't know how to use it it's not going to have that wider impact and the biggest barrier we found is of course schools are so busy at the moment they're having to deal with so many changes in guidance so many other pressures that managing to find the time to have the training you want to give them can can be really challenging but when you've done it the rewards are huge what's been so lovely about being part of the demonstrator program is the the positive feedback from schools they're so grateful and the number of times i've had teachers say to me oh well how much is it how, how much are we going to have to pay for this and it's like no this is actually a free program and that's been that's been fantastic because you can see the difference that it's making so what what can you possibly here's here, here's a question what what can you achieve a strategy in six to eight weeks or or, or do you give people the the, the sense of a, a strategic direction or do you do you get frustrated by that slightly that you you want to stay with them longer I mean clearly we've got waiting lists we've got lots of schools around the country we've increased our capacity as you know that's down to to all of your successes um, we're nearly at 50 now, 50 schools and colleges. Do you, do you get a bit frustrated that you'd like to work with them longer? Or? Heather from London Grid for Learning said to me when we started, she said, you will get attached to the schools <laughs> and you need to be prepared to let them go. You need to be clear about the time you're going to work with them and you need to be prepared. This is a short term relationship you're you know, the, you, you, you've got to accept that. I think what you do is I would not claim that we, we do everything, of course, we done but we're sowing the seeds and I think that where some of the support has been most successful is where we started working with groups of schools and where we've been working with sort of multi-academy trusts or clusters of schools yeah. and instead of saying right we're doing one-to-one -one support we started looking at a model more of saying let's look at a group of schools let's look at their group needs through a, a Google form or a survey or however you want to do it and then let's put on training that staff from lots of schools can attend at once. So we're finding that that way we're having much more impact in terms of saying, right, here's a here's a top level strategy session that all your SLT could attend. And then we're going to do a session for all your support staff in terms of what's relevant for them. And then we'll do a session for the SEN staff. And then we'll do a session for your classroom teachers. Mm -hmm. And what we've done at Denby as well is we've identified, and I know Chorney Girls, who are our partner school, have done this as well. We've identified digital practitioners in school. And so, for example, our office manager is a digital practitioner, our careers advisor is a digital practitioner, um, lots of our subject teachers are digital practitioners and where schools would then want that additional detail. So for example, I'm a science teacher, I can't do practical experiments in the classroom anymore. Every so often half of my classes has to go and self-isolate. How on earth do I do an experiment? We've got subject teachers that can actually support with that as well. So we're doing sort of strategic support but then we are also able to offer the one-to-one -one where it's where it's relevant as well and it's an evolving model we don't get everything right every school is different every school comes to you with a different set of needs and we're just trying to adapt we, we're still the newbies to the edtech demonstrator program we were sort of with the second the second group that came in so we're still learning from the from the others as well but Try, trying to adapt, trying, trying to evolve. We, we know one of our biggest challenges at Denby is since we've come back, we've had a number of groups that have then gone out again and have had to self-isolate. So we know that's a real challenge for school and it's just trying to support and help schools cope with this, this constantly changing environment. Oh, it's totally changing and I think your work as demonstrators has, has, has evolved since we launched on what March, March the 24th I think it was, or April, sorry, April the 24th and we've had to uh, react to, to really fast changing circumstances. Paul, um, this concept of a of a digital strategy, um, what is it? What does it look like? And um, is it sort of 60 pages? It's a tone, it's it's highly complicated. It seems it seems terribly intimidating, these words strategy and digital scares me. It it, it can it can be a, a weighty tome. I think if, if you if you're putting out 60 pages of, of text, you've probably missed the point though. Uh, some head teachers like to lock themselves in offices and write that kind of thing. The school improvement plan for my entire school is one page, uh, and it's one side of one page. Uh, admittedly, the font's fairly small. 
behind you. <laughs> it is actually, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, so, so no, I'm not into massive uh, amounts of, of writing. I don't have a separate ed tech strategy for my school because certainly, perhaps this is this is this is me and where and where I'm at. Um, it's not a separate issue. It's technology is integral to what yeah. we do. And and the thing I always say uh, is. There's an icon on there for pretty much every aspect of my life. If there isn't education in there, why? Why hasn't the technological revolution changed education in the way it's changed shopping, banking, socialising, you name it? What else have I got on there? Weather, NHS, COVID app. So, so it's really about how is the technology embedded and integrated into every aspect uh, and the DfE were ahead of the game a little bit with the 2019 strategy, which talked about teaching and learning, along with lots of other channels, if you like, of how are schools harnessing the potential of technology for administration, for business, for assessment, for staff training, you, you name it. So for me, on, on my school improvement plan, there will be almost no area that isn't touched by technology and in our strategic staffing, you know, roles and responsibilities on the senior team in the in the multi academy trust in the school. It's it's integral to what we do, but I would probably advocate a standalone ed tech strategy if a school feels and in the last 10 years, sadly, this has been the case. If a school feels they've really fallen behind and they've really neglected it and they're not uh, harnessing the potential, if governors are not switched on to thinking about we're going to have to dedicate some six figure sums of money to this, then it probably does need to stand alone. Uh, but I think once it's more immature, uh, it's, it should be integrated into the way you plan your school anyway. I've had a couple of comments about, well, you know, it, it, it echoes a little bit of what Emma was saying about people. Uh, they don't know what they don't know, uh, and that's fine, by the way. Yeah. Um, I think one one of the hallmarks of not only you as professionals, but the whole programme has been it's not about judgment. <laughs> yeah, but but some of the comments we've had about the panel is, you know, where 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 should we start? Yeah, and I think there is a vision. As always, we've talked already about leadership. It does come down to leaders. I'm not saying the leader always has to be the expert with all the answers, but the leader certainly needs a vision. Where do they want to take their school? And they need to be backed, whether that's their chief executive in a multi-academy trust, their chair of governors, their local authority, they need to be backed with that vision. But some people's vision through no fault of their own is underdeveloped. So I think, you know, when we were talking about managing a crisis, generic aspects of leadership, your values, your idea of what good teaching is, what what the important functions of the school are, the pastoral care, the safeguarding, the vulnerable children's needs. That was all good, solid leadership. But when actually in the crisis, the solution to lots of those problems was going to be a technological solution. That's where some leaders found themselves in fog. They didn't have vision. They couldn't see where they needed to go. And so actually what I think we need to do is you were asking, you know, are we converting from that emergency response yes. to this more strategic role? Well, I don't know about you, but in Sheffield, we're still in a crisis uh, and we're all in national lockdown. But certainly, you know, I just looked at my spreadsheet, I've got 100 students out today. It's uh, we, we are still managing the crisis. I think coming up uh, on the other side and looking back and saying, right, how has that now changed our practice and where is the, the place of technology is something we can look forward to. Um, and at that point, I think there's an absolute necessity to bring back uh, a leadership qualification in the strategic leadership of what was called ICT. We're currently calling it ed tech. Don't really care what you call it, but some yeah. people, it's not going to be for senior leaders about this is where you click, this is what you do. It's about what is the 21st century school going to be like? And how has COVID, we can take silver linings from this horrible crisis. What has COVID taught us? Because if we'd stood up with bold visions a year or two ago, it would take five, 10 year plans to really move things on. We'd never have won arguments about, I want to send several hundred Chromebooks home in the school minibus. Um, I'd never have won arguments around you know, the kind of money we've thrown at that. Actually, yes, we can put Wi-Fi in children's homes. They don't need to drill holes through the walls. We've got the dongles. We can do that. So um, and, and I dare say, most importantly, we'd never have got um, a Damascene conversion at a ministerial level, say no more, um, about, about the potential that technology really has. So, yes, we've got to come out the other side of this, get a vaccine rolled out and then get a national ed tech strategy rolled out. A new ed tech strategy. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think um, 
I, I think the 2019 strategy from the DfE was great, but that is a, a different world and we're not going back to it. And the arguments that needed to be slowly won and people who needed to be won round is now not a debate. It's not controversial anymore. People used to, you know, I used to do a lot of training of classroom teachers on how to use technology. And people might ask me, well, how do you know how to do it? Well, so no one really taught me. I just had a go. I worked it out. And that's what lots of teachers have done now. They've had to uh, leap of faith, stuck yep. in their spare bedrooms at home on a dodgy old laptop, uh, and they've done amazing things. And so they say, right, but, so that confidence side of things, not completely, but is largely a much smaller issue than it would have been. That argument winning around this stuff really does work well. This can make a difference to children's lives. The digital divide. We've talked about that for 25 years and suddenly, you know, people get the checkbooks out and uh, the can do attitude needs to stay. So that can do attitude about digital. We've had a had a question, Paul, which is how is it going to uh, off? How is it going to support future d digital opportunities within the classroom? How is this going to affect that space called the classroom? Well, the, the classroom is probably not the best thing to talk to me about because I've largely been, with some big exceptions, been, been comfortable with the idea that when children come into the classroom, it's about human interaction. It's about a, a, a talented um, craft of classroom uh, delivery by the teacher, their knowledge, their relationships with the students. Interactive whiteboards were a massive waste of money. We just needed projectors and screens. Visualizers, they're rather impressive. You can do quite a lot with those, but actual classroom technology between nine and three, not so excited about. What I'm more excited about and what lockdown really pushed forward was how do you form the seamless link between what was happening in the classroom and what happens out of the classroom when they're doing homework, when they're revising, when they're preparing for a lesson, when they're uh, having some intervention outside of the formal curriculum. How do we tie it all up so that vision and design of the curriculum um, has, has a, a common thread running through it and the delivery of the learning by the teacher might be off a platform onto their screen and uh, and but then when the children go home it all looks and feels the same and they're comfortable and they can interact with each other and with school staff just in the same way as they would in school because technology enables that um, so so it's learning technology not classroom technology got you neil thank you paul um neil i was thinking about a number of the things that you were saying about leadership about distributing leadership uh, Emma's insights on how you had to to train your staff, the NHS staff that work with you in terms of the therapeutic inputs that that team around around the child and clearly assistive technology. Um, I think what you've brought High Furlong and National Star down in uh, Gloucester, what you've brought to the programme is a real sense of assistive technology, uh, accessible technology, the way that technology is designed, it's it, it's actually for, for all young people. Um, it's not just for a niche of of needs. This is this is a power. This is a positive for for, for everybody. Is that is that fair? Absolutely, it, it is. Yeah, and and it's not just for delivering lessons and for learning. We've really had to put all our therapies remote as well. So. Um, you know, there's so many children in mainstream schools who have um, additional therapies and support um, th that they need to be able to continue uh, in, in terms of their learning and their progress. They should all, for me, be, be happening just as they would do in the school setting. Um, it, it's just a new way of delivering it. And actually, we found that there's been a real win situation to that in that our families have been involved in the therapy sessions, you know, particularly with speech and language. Uh, we have an, a, an incredible speech and language uh, therapist that works remotely with our families at the minute. And the children have come on quicker and made better progress because the, the families are involved in the sessions. And then, of course, the session is not standalone. It, it's then become part of everyday life and everyday um, interaction between key carers and family members with these children and it's been incredible to see the difference that that's made and actually even if you know the the, the vaccine came in and everything was fine and we reverted as, as much back to what the old norm was that's still something that i think we would keep as a new norm for us that's that's interesting so 
the time that you've spent skilling up parents and carers in terms of that therapy i mean this is a positive that we don't hear enough of actually um, and, I'm, and i'm sure it's not in the ofsted uh, report that was published this morning so that's a real positive isn't it i'm so glad we put the spotlight on that that you've engaged parents and carers as equals and, th and then they've become um fellow fellow professionals in inverted commas absolutely and i think the relationship and the strength the improved relationship between school and families over this lockdown for us has been instrumental. We've learned so much from families about our children yes. uh, and how to engage them, how to teach them, how to um, support their behaviour, how to communicate with them. We've learned so much from our families that actually the the, the realisation of the partnership has, has been incredible and what the what the headlines today don't capture they talk about mislearning but they don't capture the things that they've learned instead that they might not have had the opportunity to do if they'd have been in school with us all the time and our children have learned so much um you know in different skills that they've been doing in the home you know so we it, it, it's not a one size fits all is it tight it's such no, a, it's you, you can't just look at it through the through an inspection framework or um, through an exam criteria or a syllabus, you have to look at the bigger picture. And yes, some of the children have, have perhaps not learned as much as we would have liked in our scheme of work or in our curriculum design, but they've learned an awful lot of other things. Um, That's very important, I think. And, and, and I think what, what, what strikes me from all, all, all three of you is, is your humane approach it's 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 an approach that you've clearly had to uh, adapt and adopt and and change that that you've 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 had to respond to circumstances and neil your your consortium up there in in, in the northwest you talked about the strengths of hambledon and, and ribblesdale um what's what what the work the volume that you're doing as well in terms of being an edtech demonstrator um i mean i don't think you've said no to Re re receiving any schools. I mean, there was this, uh, I hate to use the word KPI, um, but you've long passed, you've long passed those um, uh, norms. What, what are the people, what do they want? What do your fellow professionals want from you? Is it is it humanity or is it technical advice on how to use Microsoft Teams? I th do you know, I think it's a bit of both. I think, I think for a lot of them, it's that comfort blanket of being able to speak to someone and saying, is this right? Am I doing this right? Um, will this do what it need, what we need it to do? Or is there something better? And it's about, um, we're very lucky. I, I have a team of staff here who are skilled with, with assistive technology. And in order to be skilled with assistive technology, you have to be skilled with all the other technologies that support that. So we're lucky in this environment that we can bounce off each other in that sense. We've learned so much from being involved with the other two schools, as I said, and, and having that network of experience and expertise, I think is more what they're looking for. It's, it's that sounding board to be able to say, this is what we're thinking, or we need to do this, and somebody to be able to guide them, point out the pitfalls that we've been down or that yeah. other schools have been down, um, you know and and to be able to set up simple systems it's not about setting up complicated systems yeah, really. it's about setting up simple effective systems that do what you need them to do but also reduce the workload that make it easy that isn't exhaustive and um too technical um for normal people if you will to be able to deliver it on the ground and thinking about your journey, as we've talked about, I mean, what, what's your wish? What's your wish in the, in the, in the final few minutes that we've got left? E e each of you, Neil, what's what's your wish for, for, for the future? This the, 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 the bright, the bright, lovely future that we've got ahead. What, what, what is it you'd, you'd like to see? Um, for, for me, it's about sustaining what we've put in place at Steed, making sure that it is sustainable so that when you know we regularly have children that will be in hospital for long periods of time we've had children in hospital who've been following our lessons and dialing into class and seeing the peers we've never had that before it's about that sustainability for me yeah i think that's a that's a great wish emma what's uh, what's your wish as we as we head towards the end of this panel and um, that we don't look on this as like a contingency plan 
that we don't say when there's a vaccine or when you know everyone's back in school and no one's mm -hmm. isolated anymore that we just go back to how we were doing things before you know I, I want us to learn from this I want us to take what's worked well and, and continue to use it and, and build and evolve on that because like I say I think there are some things that we all know we, we do better now whether we intended to or not and just making sure we don't lose that lose that learning thanks very much Emma Paul I think empowerment is the the phrase that that springs to mind for me because uh, I, I can see a future where we're truly mobile we're truly flexible devices for every student for every teacher where you can work between home you can work between school uh, learners are, are able to access uh, learning content support talk to each other and collaborate and the same for teachers teachers collaborating teachers working seamlessly between home and school and looking at flexible working patterns and actually all being empowered by the potential that technology has and really harnessing that potential because um, I think we've been ignoring a lot of it but also I think another thing that's been happening um, whilst we've been going through this crisis is the tech companies have been accelerating their development so you can now do things uh, in October and November that you couldn't do back in March and April with some of the technology so uh, so yeah empowerment and, and a bright future that's a lovely uh, way to end it all, all three of you thank you so much um, and we'd urge I mean clearly the four of us would urge people to join the EdTech demonstrator program EdTech dash demonstrator dot lgfl dot net and it's great to work with people like Sheffield Hallam University uh, and London Grid for Learning uh, and ourselves on this program but I think the real stars as uh, everybody who's watching this and everybody who'll see the recording is uh, these three who are representative I think of a generosity and a leadership in this profession uh, that has risen to the challenge that I frankly feel uh, are not celebrated enough and what this week is about is supporting schools that are out there with ideas and support and as and as Neil said quite rightly this is about professional to professional it's about benchmarking it's about checking in it's about a level of comfort um, that's a good word uh, as human beings that you're on the right track so thank you all thank you very much for taking 50 odd minutes out of your busy 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 lives uh, i really appreciate it and thank you for all your work uh, on the edtech demonstrator program um, all the schools and colleges are really really appreciative thank you so much <laughs>